Welcome back to our YouTube channel. Today I want to talk about the Merchant of Venice. And before you start this video lecture, I would like you to create an overview of the play's characters and the play's plot by yourself. This will, as usual, improve your understanding of the play. So now please pause the video for half an hour, create an overview of characters and plot, and then just continue with the video. Today, I first of all want to talk about the genre of the Merchant of Venice. Our last video lecture ended with a discussion of the genre of The Tempest. We said it's a comedy, one of Shakespeare's romances, and The Merchant of Venice is commonly considered to be a comedy as well. So let's just recap on the term comedy. A comedy is a humorous play, so it is a humorous plot, and it has a happy ending. But Let's think about The Merchant of Venice. Does that really apply to The Merchant of Venice as well? So there's another task for you. Before you continue with the video, please think about the question whether The Merchant of Venice is really simply comic and whether there's a happy ending. So let's talk about The Merchant of Venice as comedy. On the one hand, we can certainly find comic elements in the play. For example, just think about the comic character Lancelot. Or think about Portia disguising as a man. These are common elements of comedies that we find frequently in Shakespeare's plays. And women disguising as men was certainly something that was yeah, quite f funny, quite interesting for the audience in the Eliza Elizabethan theatre. So we could certainly say... These are comic elements, so Merchant of Venice is a happy comedy? I wouldn't say. Why? There are elements in this play that are rather problematic. And two of them I want to discuss today in this video lecture. One of them is anti-Semitism, the other one is gender. But I just said there are problematic elements in this play. So commonly, The Merchant of Venice is considered to be one of Shakespeare's problem plays. Problematic elements, one of Shakespeare's problem plays. What does that mean, problem play? A problem play is a play that is partly but not entirely comic. It also discusses issues that are ra rather serious in nature, so it's not entirely humorous. That's what, that was one of the um, two parts of the definition that I mentioned just now. So it's not entirely humorous, not entirely comic and funny. And there are no simple solutions to the problems that are discussed in the place. So there's no entirely happy ending. And on top of that, there are characters that are rather ambiguous. Just think of Shylock and Antonio. Okay, I said I want to talk about two of the problems that are discussed in this play. The first one is anti-Semitism. And again, before you continue with the lecture, please begin to think about the character of Shylock. What do you think about him? And what do you think about the way he's treated by the other characters? And please take notes. So now pause the video for a few minutes. Think about these questions. What do you think about Shylock? And what do you think about the way he's treated by the others? And then please continue with the video. I would say that Shylock is a problematic and rather ambiguous character. Why? On the one hand, his demand for one pound of flesh is certainly rather cruel. He's a rather revengeful character and he's full of hatred. Just think about his attitude to basically everyone in the play. This is revengeful, it's full of hatred. He presents him, himself as a character that is not agreeable. So we could argue that his punishment in the end is justified. But on the other hand, why is he like that? That's the question. He has been discriminated against for most of his life. He's socially excluded. Others treat him with disdain. He's confronted with Antonio's hatred. 
This is what Shylock states at the beginning of the play. And his own daughter runs away and steals his gold. So I guess we could, up to a certain point, understand his attitude and his reaction. So it seems to be a reaction to the way he's treated by the Christian citizens of Venice, the way he's treated by all the other characters. Yeah, so the basic argument here is he acts and his acts are a reaction to the way the other characters treat him. The question is, why do the other characters treat Shylock the way they do? And in the play there are two reasons that we could um, that we can find the first reason is money lending this is an issue that throughout the history has been commonly associated with Jews and Christian characters resented Jewish people for exactly this Christian people were not allowed to uh, lend money so they um, had to go to Jewish people and they exactly for this resented them. And the play also shows us the image of Shylock as being a bloodthirsty character. This is another image, stereotypical image of Jewish people. So we have two stereotypical images. Um, stereotypical means generalized, simplified, and in most cases unjustified. So we have stereotypical images that have historically been associated with Jewish, Jewish people. And this is what we can call racism or antisemitism. So what is racism? What is antisemitism? Racism is a belief that people of a group possess certain characteristics simply because they belong to that group. So that's discrimination against and hatred of members of that group. Again, I repeat, you believe that someone possesses certain characteristics simply because the person belongs to a certain group. So the idea, Germans are, I don't know, because they are Germans. Or Azerbaijanis are simply because they are Azerbaijanis. Jewish are whatever, simply because they are Jewish. So it does not pay attention to the individual. It does not pay, pay attention to the individual person. It simply categorizes people accord, according to their uh, according to them belonging to a certain group. This is racism. And anti-Semitism is a form of racism that is directed against Jewish people. It's a belief that Jewish, are, uh, Jewish people are inferior and this results in hatred and discrimination. Yes, so I repeat, the question is why do the other characters treat Shylock the way they do? We said money lending and Shylock's bloodthirst are reasons. These are images that, that are stereotypically associated with Jewish people. Racism is um, the reason for that. So racism means you judge someone according to his group without paying attention to the individual person. And anti-Semitism is a form of racism that is directed against Jewish people. Now I've got another task for you. Before you continue with the video lecture, please think about the question whether The Merchant of Venice is a racist play, which is to just discuss the question, what is racism? Now think about the question, is The Merchant of Venice a racist play? This means, does the play support anti-Semitism? So please find arguments pro and contra. Please take notes, so pause, this video now think about the question is it a racist play yes or is isn't it a racist play so no find arguments for both positions and then please just continue with the lesson so the question is is the merchant of venice a racist or an anti-semitic play There are two main interpretations of this play that we can find in literature. The one is, the one interpretation that Shylock is presented as a stereotypical image of a Jewish character and the play therefore supports antisemitism.
please try to understand this argument. But what does that mean? Shylock is presented by the play as a stereotypical image of a Jew. So the play does everything to show us the stereotype of a Jewish character. And the argument is, well, this is why it is an anti-Semitic play. The other position is that Shylock is rather presented as a victim. So the play, this is how the argument goes, the play is not anti-Semitic, but it's rather philo-Semitic. So what does that mean? It means it has a positive attitude towards Jewish people and Jewish culture. Yeah, again, what are the two main interpretations of this play? One is, it is anti-Semitic. Why? Because it does everything to show Shylock as a Jewish character with all the negative images that are commonly associated in history with Jewish people. That's the one position. The other position is, no, it is not anti-Semitic. It's philosemitic. Why? Because it shows us that Shylock is a victim. He suffers. The other characters are the problem. In that case, we, we could say it has a, a rather positive attitude towards Jewish people. Okay, let's think about that. Let's think about arguments that support the claim of anti-Semitism. So arguments in favor of the idea, the interpretation that the play is anti-Semitic, racist. One argument I just mentioned already the stereotypical depiction of the Jewish character. We can also say Shylock is a very negative character. He shows very aggressive and revengeful behavior. So at first glance, when we do not read so carefully, I would say, the play can be seen as being anti-Semitic. But only that's the point, that's my argument, and an argument, of course, that you can find in many texts. The play can at first glance only be regarded as being anti-Semitic. But there are also arguments against this idea that the Merchant of Venice is anti-Semitic. Because the play, as we already said, the play shows Shylock's behavior as a reaction to the treatment by the other, by the Christian characters. So we could argue that the other characters' anti-Semitism ultimately created this aggressive and revengeful character, Shylock. Please try to understand this argument. Shylock, so to speak, reacts in this way because the others treat him like that. They basically turn him into what he is now. So this is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The other characters act in a way that their assumptions about Jewish people become true in the end. So they were not so at the beginning. We can assume that Shylock was not like that at the beginning. I think that's a plausible argument. He became what he is because they turned him into what he is now. They treated him in such a negative way with all the hatred, all the disdain, and in the end, he basically behaves in the way he behaves now. He reacts aggressively. Who wouldn't? How would you react? If someone treats you the way he is treated, I don't think you or me would be very agreeable in the end. If we face all that hatred, we would probably also turn in someone full of disdain and hatred. So that's the other argument. The argument, it's not anti-Semitic display. It shows a Shylock and his behavior as a reaction to the way he is treated by the other characters. So as a result, what can we say? I would say that this play is uh, not anti-Semitic, but the characters are. That's the point. The play itself is not. The characters are. Clearly, they hate Shylock simply because he is a Jew. That's anti-Semitism. The play itself <clears throat> shows us the process or the mechanism of anti-Semitism, so it shows us how anti-Semitism and racism work. What does that exactly mean? So how does this mechanism of racism work in The Merchant of Venice? First of all, it is based on prejudices and stereotypes. So as I said at the beginning, images that are generalized, simplified, in most cases not true. So that's the beginning. The characters, the other characters, 
have prejudices and stereotypes. And then they discriminate against members of the other religious group, against the Jewish people. And they thereby only create this other character. Shylock, at the beginning, was not like that. Only because they have these stereotypes, only because they discriminate against him, because they treat him the way they do, only this finally creates this other they need. The other means a member of an imagined group where they can project all their prejudices and stereotypes onto. So the point is Shylock's revengefulness is not based on his ethnic or religious background, but simply on his treatment by the Venetian characters. That's the point. So this is basically how, mechan how, how, how the mechanism of racism in the Merchant of Venice works. So let's conclude. This play is a comedy, but certainly a problematic one. We have discussed the issue of anti-Semitism. We will soon come to the issue of gender. But only the issue of anti-Semitism anti would be enough to say this is a very problematic play. This is why they are commonly called problem plays. This play confronts the audience with the issue of racism, the issue of anti-Semitism. But I think what becomes clear is that the play itself is not racist. Its characters are. So rather than being racist, the play shows us how anti-Semitism works. Namely, what does that mean? Anti-Semitic uh, anti characters discriminate against the Jewish protagonist. And this is how they only, and first of all, create this aggressive Shylock that we then see in the course of the play. This is the basic argument. And this I mentioned as one of our learning objectives. We should begin to understand, we should begin to think critically. And all this only becomes clear if we begin to read this play critically and not just um, yeah, believe what, what other people tell us about this play or um, just Google a bit. We have to read it carefully. We have to think about it carefully. And if we read this carefully, if we think about it crit critically, I think this is a very plausible um, outcome. As I said, it's a problem play. It's a comedy, but certainly not a happy comedy. It discusses the issue of racism, and it shows us how racism, how anti-Semitism works. And this is something that I would say is certainly not very funny. Okay, but let's turn to the second topic, to the topic of gender. And again, please, before you continue with this video lecture, think about the question how the issue of gender manifests itself in the play The Merchant of Venice. Again, please take notes. So pause the video now, please. Think about this for a few minutes, take notes, and then please continue with the lecture. Okay, how does the is issue of gender manifest itself in this play? I would say that it focuses on the question of female gender roles. And the interesting thing is, this is part of the Shylock plot, but this is also part of the fairy tale plot of the play. So think about Belmont, about Portia. This is the fairy tale plot um, of this play and the issue of female gender roles is actually part of both of these subplots. So even in the second and seemingly unproblematic plot of the play, the Belmont plot, we see a rather problematic issue. And so again, I would say The Merchant of Venice is not simply a happy comedy. But of course, we have to talk about that in detail now, because I simply say it's problematic, I have to prove that. So let's uh, look at, uh, have a closer look at the issue of gender. What we see that in, initially, the young female characters, Portia and Jessica, are under, contro under the control of their fathers. It doesn't matter whether they are alive or as 
uh, Portia's father dead, they still control the life of their daughters. And we can also see that Portia, at least, seems to be interesting to her suitors only because of her wealth. So she's perceived rather less, uh, rather like an object, rather like, like something that you can buy, not really as an individual, it seems. So marriage to some of these suitors seems to be rather like an like a economic or financial transaction. What is more is, both Portia and Jessica are certainly not really satisfied with this situation. Just think about what Portia says. I might neither choose who I would, nor refuse who I dislike. So is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father? Curbed means restricted. So what does she say here? She says, I cannot choose the man I want, and I cannot refuse the man I do not want, because my dead father put up some regulations that restrict my liberty. And she makes it very clear that she's unhappy about that. So again, let's repeat. What did I just say? The young char female characters are under control of their fathers. When it comes to Portia, they don't really, the, the young men that want to marry her, uh, don't really seem to be interested in her uh, individuality, in her personality, in her as an individual human being. Some of them, at least, seem to be rather interested in her wealth. So she seems to be an object, and what we can clearly see is that the young female characters are very unhappy with that. So um, what we can see is that the female characters try to resist patriarchy. What does patriarchy mean? Just uh, let's recap on that. Patriarchy basically means male dominance. Jessica flees her father's house and control. Portia disguises as a lawyer in order to influence the course of uh, events. So Portia turns into someone else. But the interesting thing is she has to disguise as a man in order to do so. As a woman, she couldn't do this. So this is an indication, as I would say, of the general powerlessness of women in the Venice as we see it in the play. Again, I'm just talking about problems of the gender issue here. We see that the characters, the female characters try to resist patriarchy. They try to run away like Jessica. They try to influence the procedures that are going on in the play. Portia disguises as a lawyer, but she can only do this as a man, being disguised as a man. And what is more, marriage remains the ultimate goal of female destiny in this play. So the question is, in the end, who will be in power in these marriages? Portia, at some point in the play, mentions to Bassanio, her future husband, this house, these servants, and this same myself, so I, Portia, are yours, my lords. So Bassanio's. So basically she describes a situation where she hands over everything to Bassanio. He is now master lord of the house of everything including Portia. So let's conclude. The play I would say and its end are rather ambiguous. So uh, ambiguous again what does that mean not clear. The female characters have shown resistance but they had to elope, so what does that mean? They had to run away like Jessica, or they had to act in the disguise of man, Portia, in order to obtain some sort of liberation or some sort of power. And I would say that this is certainly no statement of female autonomy. What does that mean, autonomy? The right to decide for yourself. So I would say that the power relationships power relationships between men and women are not finally settled at the end of the play. The female characters show resistance, but on the other hand, the way they do it are no sign of real power and uh, the ability to decide for yourself. 
So on the one hand resistance, on the other hand restrictions. This I would say is not really solved in the end. So the power relations between men and women are not finally settled at the end. So in both um, issues, anti-Semitism and um, gender, I would say the end is a bit unclear, slightly open, rather problematic. Shylock the Jew is, is heavily punished. The situation for the women is not clear in the end. Again, we are back to the question, comedy, problem play, happy ending, yes or no. Okay, so this was the end for today. Thanks for watching. And I will soon uh, produce another video and upload another video then on King Lear, the next play that we're going to discuss. Goodbye.